Hello everyone, welcome to the Material Science Class MIG 300. Uh, this is chapter seven. Chapter seven, we are going to discuss dislocations and we're gonna focus over the different mechanism of the plastic deformation of the material at the microstructure level. In the meanwhile, we are going to discuss the strengthening mechanisms. So as we discussed in chapter six, that the plastic deformation is a permanent change in the material shape or dimensions or whatever. So it is a permanent thing. This is the plastic deformation. Also, we discussed that the strength, hardness, and the other mechanical properties that already depend on the plastic behavior of the material, they are kind of measured. They can be considered as measures of the material's resistance to this plastic deformation. As we discussed in chapter six, that there is the yield point. This yield point, it what distinguish the elastic behavior from the plastic behavior of the material. Within the elastic region, the material, if we remove the force or the applied stress, the material carries it back again to its original shape. But in the plastic deformation, the material is gonna exhibit a permanent change in the shape or the dimension that indicate that there is a plastic deformation in the material. So we can judge whatever this material has experienced, a severe pla uh, plastic deformation or not, this basically depends on its appearance. If you can clearly see that there is a change over the original shape and dimensions of the material. So in that case, at the microscopic scale, we can say that this material has experienced a plastic deformation or had exhibited a plastic deformation. Why? Because we do have a permanent change in the shape or the dimensions of this material. But the question is, what is happening at the micro scale? At the microscopic scale, plastic deformation corresponds to the net movement of large numbers of atoms in response to an applied stress. When we applying a stress, and this stress is big enough to bring the material to the plastic deformation, what's going on inside the material microstructure? At the microscopic scale, as we see the material, it will be seen with a permanent change in shape and dimension, as we mentioned. But what about the microstructure? Inside the material microstructures, atoms are going to leave their own sites and they're gonna attain another lattice sites that it with the same almost with the same concept like diffusion like when we apply a force or a stress that is big enough to bring the material to the plastic deformation atoms they're gonna rupture their bonds and they're gonna deform again new bonds in new lattice sites so these atoms they are going to migrate from one lattice site to other lattice site but plastic, so it is almost the same concept like diffusion, but there is a slight difference between diffusion and the plastic deformation. Within the plastic deformation, atoms are moving in groups. Atoms are moving in planes. So you're gonna find like a plane of atoms, this plane of atoms, all the atoms, they're gonna rub each other and they're gonna break the bonds that they do have at their lattice sites, and then they're gonna migrate to another lattice site all together as one plane, as a group of atoms to form a new plane where to reform again bonds with other, within new lattice sites. So this is what is exactly happening inside the material microstructure in case that we are exposing the material into a high stress that brings the material into plastic deformation. So at the microstructure level, we can judge whatever this material experiences or is doing plastic deformation or not by measuring how many atoms are already moving or observing the movement of atoms and or this group of atoms inside the material microstructure. If these atoms are moving and they are leaving their sites to new other sites, this indicate that there is a plastic deformation that is happening. But if there is no atoms movement or migration from one lattice site to other lattice site, this could indicate that there is a still elastic behavior or elastic deformation of the material and we didn't achieve the plastic deformation yet. Make sense? So in crystalline solids, and we said that all metals are crystals or crystalline solids, some, many of the ceramic material, they are crystalline, some of the polymer material, they could be counted as crystalline solids. Plastic deformation most often involves the motion of dislocation. As we discussed in chapter four, dislocation it is one of the linear crystalline defects. It is a linear type of defect and we were or material crystal imperfection. And the dislocation, we discussed that we do have two different types of dislocation. We do have edge dislocation or exclusive dislocation. 
So in the plastic deformation, when we expose the material into a very high stress and the material should be plastically deformed, these occasions are going to move. So we can measure the severely of the plastic deformation, how much of plastic deformation that this material is experiencing based on what, based on the movement of the dislocation. If the dislocation is going to move from one place to another place, definitely this indicates that there is a plastic deformation. But if the dislocation is not moving, this indicates that the force is not big enough and mostly the material is gonna be within the, its elastic behavior and there is no plastic deformation in that case. So generally we're gonna say, we can say that the plastic deformation is the motion of large numbers of dislocation. So it is not just the movement of atoms. So you won't gonna be confused with the diffusion because the movement of atoms, as we mentioned in chapter five, it is diffusion mechanism. But here in the plastic deformation, these atoms are moving in group, moving as plane of atom that is going to move or a group of atom that is going to move to exhibit a dislocation. So this dislocation, when it moves, this indicates that there is a plastic deformation. Make sense? So the dislocation motion, so since the focus over the dislocation motion, let us describe how these dislocations are moving inside the material microstructure, indicating that there is a plastic deformation. So the dislocation motion or slip, we can say the slip, it is counted as the dislocation motion. So the dislocation motion inside the material microstructure also it is named as slip. So the slip it is the process by which the plastic deformation is produced by dislocation motion. So this statement indicates somehow that the plastic deformation, it is not necessary to be conjugate with a dislocation motion. You got my point? As in general, as we define here, the plastic deformation, it involves the migration of atoms from one lattice side to another lattice side. Very similar to the diffusion, but most of they are moving like in groups. Even, but it is not necessary. In some cases, we may have one single atom that is going to leave its side that is seat somewhere in another lattice side, which is, as I mentioned, very similar to the diffusion. But most, in most of the cases, especially in crystalline solid, and as we mentioned here, in crystalline solid material, this is what is happening in general. Whatever this material is a crystal material or crystalline solid material or amorphous material. In amorphous material, it is difficult to find a specific arrangement of atom and mostly atoms are moving independent. But here in crystalline solids, atoms are moving in groups as a plane of atom and this involves the movement of dislocation. This is what is happening in crystalline solid material and this is the focus over this part so far. Make sense? So in the process of the plastic deformation, the, uh, the, what, what does it mean slip slip? It is the process by which the plastic deformation is produced by dislocation motion. Like, or we can say that the slip, it, it, it describes the dislocation motion itself in order to achieve a plastic deformation of the material. And the slip or the dislocation motion or dislocations are moving over a plane. This plane is known as the slip plane. So what is the slip plane? It is a crystallographic plane. And we discussed in chapter three, what does it mean a crystallographic plane? And we said that, for example, in cubic crystal, this crystallographic plane can be defined using three indices. In hexagonal crystal, they should be described by four indices, right? So crystallographic plane, it is a plane of atom like when, as we mentioned, slip plane, it is the crystallographic plane along which the dislocation line is going to move. It is not the dislocation, if you remember, if you recall from chapter four, when we were discussing the defects, this linear defect, which is the dislocation, we said that we'd have two types of dislocations, we'd have edge dislocation and screw dislocation, and everyone is described by a dislocation line. This dislocation line indicates where is the location of the dislocation, whatever it is, edge dislocation or screw dislocation. So the dislocation plane, it is a crystallographic plane, a group of atoms, a plane of atoms over which the dislocation line, the line of the dislocation is going to move. So again, the plastic deformation, it is generally described at the microstructure level by the movement of the dislocation. This is known as a slip. So the, the slip, it is the movement of the dislocation inside the material microstructure in order to achieve a plastic deformation. 
slip plane, it is a crystallographic plane along which or over which the dislocation line or the line of the dislocation is going to move. Because of what? Because of an external applied stress. These dislocations, they won't gonna move unless we are subjecting the material into a very high stress that is big enough to bring the material it, into its plastic behavior with a stress that exceeds the yield strength of the material. So we're gonna achieve some dislocation movement. So like in this case, for example, as you can see, let us assume that this tau represents the shear stress that is going to act over the material and this shear stress is big enough to achieve plastic deformation. So if this highlighted plane indicates that the edge dislocation, we said that in the edge dislocation, it is like a plane of atom that is going to terminate inside the material and excess, an extra plane of atom that is going to terminate inside the crystal itself. Like you can have this plane of atom that terminates at this point and this symbol or this indicate the dislocation line. So as we apply the shear stress, this plane of atom is going to move in this direction. So this is the direction of motion of what? Of the dislocation plane itself. In the meanwhile, it is the same direction of motion of the dislocation line. So this dislocation line is going to move over this surface, over this plane. This is the plane over which this dislocation line, because this is this symbol, this thing, all of this edge that located this indicate the dislocation line. This dislocation line is going to move over this plane in this direction. So simply this plane is going to be counted as the slip plane. So the plastic deformation, this is, this is like a representation how the plastic deformation by the edge dislocation motion is going to take place. And this is the slip plane. How about the screw dislocation? And the screw dislocation, the style is still. These are the shear stresses that acting over this crystal that is big enough to achieve some plastic deformation of the material. It means that the dislocation is going to move, is going to migrate from one place to another place or, or it's going to move over a plane or over a surface. So what is the dislocation line for the screw dislocation? So this is the plastic deformation by screw dislocation motion. This line, this line that is, should be extended inside the crystal, this is the dislocation line for a screw dislocation. As you shear the material more, this plane is going, this line is going to move in this direction. So we're gonna say that this is the direction of motion of the dislocation line or the direction of motion of the dislocation itself. As you can see, this line is going to migrate or is going to move over this plane. So there should be a plane here. Over this surface, this is the surface of movement of this dislocation because as you tear more, as you shear more this crystal, this part is going to be teared, it's going to be cut and it's going to propagate. I mean like deal with this thing like it is a crack and this crack is going to propagate and is increase. In that case, the dislocation line is going to move back over this surface. So that's why this surface, it will be counted at the slip plane. So again, the slip plane, this is the crystallographic plane over which or along which the dislocation line is going to move. So this is, for example, the appearance of the material at the macrostructure level. Whatever it had, this shape has been produced because of the movement of edge dislocation. And we're going to get almost the same shape even if we have done like movement or we achieve the movement of a screw dislocation. So at the macrostructure level, it could be difficult for us to distinguish whatever this plastic deformation has been happened because of an edge dislocation or because of a screw dislocation. Because as you can see, this is the macrostructure. This is the macroscopic plastic deformation. It is permanent deformation that results from the movement of the dislocation in response to the applied shear stress. Because of this shear stress, the, this plane of atom is gonna keep on moving, keep on moving till it will be projected or rejected over the other side with this amount. So this amount or this distance or this distance, which should be the same distance, this is a representation of how much of plastic deformation this material has experienced at the macroscopic de plastic deformation. How we, this is how we apparently see the material. The same thing, whatever you are doing plastic deformation uh, through edge dislocation or screw dislocation. Through the edge dislocation movement, this is the edge, this plane or edge dislocation is gonna keep on moving, keep on moving till it will be projected or rejected over the other side. 
As you can see, it is like a perfect surface here. But if as we keep applying this shear stress, this dislocation will be rejected over the other side, indicating that there is a plastic deformation as a parent change in the shape of this crystal. The same thing is going to happen here. If you're gonna keep on shearing this crystal, this thing is going to be cracked more and this crack is going to propagate that it would be at the end if we're gonna keep moving this line, the dislocation line, if it's gonna keep moving till the end of the surface, this is gonna result in you have this top part, it will be like kind of completely separate from the lower part and you're gonna end up with this new shape of the material or the crystal that indicating that there is a plastic deformation that is going to happen. But remember that this plastic deformation happens because of a screw dislocation. This plastic deformation happens because of an edge dislocation or because of a movement of edge dislocation to be more accurate and movement of a screw dislocation in that case. But as I mentioned, as you can see, the two shapes are apparently the same. So over the macroscopic scale, we cannot know exactly if we decided to judge over the plastic deformation at the macroscopic scale as we see the material, we cannot judge or we cannot say that whatever it had been happened because of an edge dislocation movement or because of a screw dislocation movement, unless we have to look inside the material microstructure and observe the type of the dislocation, whatever it is, edge dislocation or a screw dislocation. Make sense? All right, so that this dislocation movement or plastic deformation depends on the type of bonding between atoms? Yes, for sure. Why? Because as we define the plastic deformation here, during the plastic deformation atoms, they're gonna leave their sites, so they have to rupture or break their bonds, and they're gonna deform new bonds in any other new site. And it means that definitely, the plastic deformation should be related to the type of bonding between the atoms. Over chapter two, we discussed that we do have three types of bonds. We do have metallic bond, we do have covalent bond or ionic bond. That is going to form all the material that we have as natural material. So how about if we have a metallic bond? How about if we do have a covalent bond or we do have the ionic bond? How easy or how difficult that we can achieve some plastic deformation inside the material microstructure depending on the bonding type, this is what we are going to explain. So metals, this occasion motion in metals, it would be much more easy than any other material. Metals, they can be simply plastically deformed. We said that the plastic deformation, it is related to the dislocation motion. So as it becomes more easy for the dislocation to move, between the different crystals or even within the same crystal, this indicates that there is an easy way to perform a plastic deformation of the material. So in metal, the dislocation motion or achieving the plastic deformation, it is much more easy in metal. Why? What is, why this thing? Because this because of the non-directional bonding, there is no specific bond, and this is thing that we knew from chapter two, that the metal, metallic bond is the weakest of the three types of bond that we have. It is more weak than covalent or ionic bond. This is one reason. So that's why the dislocation, it could be much more easy to be achieved. As you can see, in addition, another thing, because of the non-directional bond, there is no specific bond that you can identify between every two atoms. And this is thanks to the electron cloud that is going to more work like a lubricant. These free cloud of electrons, this is the cloud of electron that could be exist for metal. It's gonna work like a lubricant that is going to allow for the easy sliding of a plane of atom with respect to the other one. So think of it in this way, like assume that this is a plane of atom and this is another plane of atom and this is another third plane of atom. These atoms, they are not bonded strongly like any other type of bonding. It is a metallic bond, so it is a weak kind of bond. But in order to achieve a dislocation, it means that this plane of atom, for example, is going to slide or glide over with respect to the other two planes. So you're gonna just gonna push this plane in the middle. As I think of it, assume this thing that is going to happen. So if we try to push this plane of atom in the middle, it's gonna be in the, in the middle or between these two planes, it's gonna be much more easily pushed. Why? Because it is not bonded. It is bonded by a metallic bond, but it is a weak bond and it is non-directional. There is no specific direction or limits over this bond. 
It is free thing. And thanks because of the electron cloud, which is going to work like a lubricant that is going to allow for the easy sliding of this plane with respect to the other plane. So the plastic deformation of the disocclusion motion is going to be much more easy to be achieved within the metal material. But how about covalent ceramic? Like ceramic material, we said that the covalent, mo most of the ceramic, they are either made of covalent bond or ceramic or ionic bond. So in the covalent bond, like silicon or, or diamond, these are ceramic material that mainly made or formed by covalent bond. Covalent bond, it is directional, uh, but the metallic it is non-directional. What does it mean, directional? It means that the covalent bond, it is there. And it should keep every two atoms who are sharing their electrons together to form a specific bond which is very strong. So since it is strong, and this is the thing that we knew from chapter two, we are expecting that the covalent bond or a material with a covalent bond, the, the dislocation movement or achieving plastic deformation by dislocation movement with, within this material, it is not that easy. It will be difficult. So this location motion in covalent ceramic materials or material with covalent bonds, it will be difficult com in comparison to metals. And the reason is because of the directional, the strong directional bonding. And this bonding, it is angular. What does it mean angular? For example, if you try to slide or glide this surface or this plane of atom in the middle with respect to the other one in order to indicate that there, that, that there is a dislocation movement, this atom, for example, is going to be moved up to here, the second one, the third one, and so on. So this is the new location of the atoms. And as you can see, this bond is going to be oriented. It's going to be angular. It can be oriented in that way to keep holding these two atoms together. Thanks to this atom that is directional. Direction indicate that, as I mentioned, it is set up between two specific atoms unless you're gonna completely break this, this bond, completely break this bond in order to achieve a high plastic deformation of the material. So this is how it works, just to understand how this bonding is going to work. Like think of these new sides of the atoms. So we still have the atoms in that case, and this is the new atom. So think of it like we just pushed this middle plane of atoms to the right. So these new sites indicate the new location of these atoms. But as you can see, the bond, it has been oriented, has been rotated to still be hold or connecting these two atoms together. So in that case, we still within the elastic behavior of the material. We said that there is elastic and there is plastic deformation, right? Why we still in the elastic behavior of the material? Because the bond that is still set up. So simply, if we remove the force, these two, these, this plane of atom will reset back again to its perfect location. So think of this bond like it is a string. And now we just moved this plane of atom in the middle. We stretching these bonds, we stretching these strings, but they are not broken yet. They are still there. They are angular, they are directional, they are keep on holding and bonding these two atoms together. So in order to achieve a plastic deformation, in order to achieve a plastic deformation, we have to apply more force, we have to apply more stress over the material, and this stress it should be big enough in order to break these bonds, to cut these strengths. So if we cut these strengths, now we can achieve some dislocation movement and physically this plane of atom is going to be free. It has been free and it can now be moved to another lattice site or to other location and it's going to reform again new bond and this is basically what is happening in the covalent bond. So that's why the force here it is bigger that is needed to achieve this occasion movement, it will be bigger than the one that exists in the metal. Why? Because in metal, there is no specific bond. There is no that such a strong bond that gonna keep on holding these atoms together. So with any slight force, whatever it is, this plane is gonna be freely moved because it is already broken. It is kind of, there is no bonding there. Almost there is no bonding, but it is still there is bonding between atoms, but it is very weak that is going to allow for the easy sliding of one plane with respect to the other one. But in the covalent bond, because the bond is 
strong and it is there and we have to break it. This requires more and more force to break the bond and allow for and free this middle plane of atom to slide and to move to achieve a dislocation movement. This is what is happening in the covalent bond. But in the ionic bond or ceramic material with ionic bond like the NaCl, the dislocation it is still difficult. Why? Because what we knew from chapter 2 that the ionic bond there is also one type of the strong bond. There is a strong like the covalent bond in some cases it could be even more stronger than the covalent bond and definitely it is stronger than the, than the metallic bond. So the dislocation movement or achieving plastic deformation in this material it is not that easy, it is difficult. But in the ionic bond, how, why it is difficult? We could understand it because of the strong bonding that exists between the atoms here. But in the ionic bond, it needs to avoid bringing two ions. Because if you remember in chapter 2 also, we said that the ion, this is an atom with a, with a specific charge. That whatever it could be with a positive charge or a negative charge. In the ionic bond, one atom it should release an electron, so this atom will attain a positive charge, and the other atom is gonna take this release electron, so it will be more negative. So it's gonna attain a negative ion or a negative charge. So as you can see, the atoms inside the material structure for the ionic bond, it will be either a positive or negative, and there should be a bonding between this positive and negative bonding between positive and negative and so on. So think of it, if we try to slide this middle plane with respect to the other planes, what's going on? What, what is going to happen in that case? If we push this one to the right, what is going to happen? This atom, it will be placed here. And this positive will, pl will be placed into the negative and negative will be positive, will be placed. So this atom, all of these atoms will be pushed in that direction. When this negative comes to replace the place of the positive ion in that case. So we're going to have like a repulsive force that is going to generate. So as you try to push this plane, as, as we try to push this plane in this direction and we're going to push this atom in this direction, the distance between these two negative, it becomes more and more shorter because this distance here, it is shorter than this hypotenuse distance, right? So as this atom, or this ion of the same charge as this one comes close or move to the right because of the applied force. This is the applied force or the stress. What's going, what, what's going to happen here? There is a repulsive force and this repulsive force depends on the distance between these two ions. As this distance is bigger, this repulsive force is smaller. But as this distance comes shorter, the repulsive force becomes bigger and bigger and increase. So as we try to push this ion to the right, the distance between the two ions of the same charge, the, it gonna, it's going to be much more shorter. And in that case, there is a huge repulsive force that is going to generate, that is going to avoid bringing this ion close to the other ion. So as we try to push in this direction, there is another repulsive force that is going to keep pushing the ion on the opposite side. So the repulsive force push in this direction. So we can break it down into two components. So one of the components is gonna push against the applied force that we are doing because of the repulsive force that is going to generate between these two ions that it should be of the same charge. The same thing is going to be generated over the two positives. And then there is another repulsive force between these two negatives and another repulsive force between these two positive and so on. So all of these repulsive forces, they are working against the applied force. The tendency of this applied force is to slide this plane to the right, while the repulsive force, it's going to push against this force to keep it pushing it on the left side. So you're going to have a reduced effect of this force and in that case to avoid this repulsive force and to break it and to bring these atoms to move to the right side, we have to increase the applied force. Other than that, we won't gonna able to move this plane in the middle. Make sense? So this is, that's why in the ionic bond or the ionic ceramics, need, we need to avoid bringing. Why? 
Why the plastic deformation or the dislocation motion is difficult in ionic bond? Because in ionic bond, we have two or atoms or ions need to avoid bringing two ions of the same charge or the same sign to, uh, together or close to each other. So this will produce a repulsive force that is going to work against the applied force. And that's why we have to increase the force in order to avoid or to outweigh or overcome this repulsive effect so we can glide or we can move the plane of atoms to achieve the, uh, the plastic deformation by this location motion. Make sense? So definitely this thing explained that how these atoms or the dislocation motion and accordingly the plastic deformation it depends on the uh, metallic bond or the bond type in the material type whatever it is metal or ceramic material make sense so since we are talking about the dislocation motion and we said that the plastic deformation that is described by dislocation motion let us investigate more how these dislocations are moving inside the crystal structure let us start with the edge dislocation, then we are going to explain how this screw dislocation is going to be achieved. So in the edge dislocation, assume that there is a crystal and the dislocation is already there. So what does it mean? As we discussed in chapter four, we said that it is difficult to find this perfect crystal, to find this material with a perfect crystal. Anyway, there should be some defects inside the material structure at the microstructure level. One of these defects is the dislocation. So this is the material before the plastic deformation. We didn't apply any force, we didn't do anything. This is the material as we brought this material. As we, this material has been provided to us, we got it with this kind of dislocation. So it is a default thing. Now we are going to apply a stress. Over the top part, the direction of the stress will be directed over this plane. To move this upper part to the right, while the other part will be moved to the left. So for the edge dislocation to be moved, the direction of the stress, it should be perpendicular to the dislocation line. So this is the edge dislocation, right? And this is the dislocation line, or in other words, the shear stress, the direction of the stress, it should be perpendicular to the plane. This is the plane of, this is the edge dislocation. This is the half of plane or a part of plane that terminates inside the crystal, indicating that there is an edge dislocation. The direction of the stress, it should be perpendicular to this plane or perpendicular to the dislocation line. So this is the, this little thing, this is the dislocation line. So we push to the right, the upper part, while the lower part is gonna be pushed to the left. So what's going to have, what, what is going to happen, this plane is gonna keep on moving. Now it attain a lattice side, which is plane A, after a while, because of the applied force, it's going to attain another lattice side, which is plane B. Then after another, after a while, it's going to keep on moving and jumping between the different crystallographic plane. It will be rejected until it will be rejected over the other side. But remember that this crystallographic plane, it could move only one lattice, like it's going to jump only one lattice, or like one lattice side one lattice distance, or it could be moved two lattice distance or three lattice distance and four, depending on the applied shear stress. So as we increasing the stress, this plane is going to jump different crystallographic planes. But anyway, this is simply how it's gonna happen in the, as our, how this edge dislocation is going to move inside the crystal structure. To describe it more, we have to identify where is the slip plane. The slip plane here, it will be over this plane. Why? Because as we're gonna keep pushing this plane to the right, this edge dislocation line, this is the dislocation line is gonna keep on moving over this surface. So this surface or this plane of atom represents the slip plane. We said that the slip plane, this is the plane over which the uh, dislocation line is going to move, right? So initially, the shear stress it should be applied perpendicular to the dislocation line, as I mentioned. Plane A is forced to move to the right because of the applied stress, and the top halves of the planes, A, B, C, D, gonna do the same thing, are will be pushed, are pushed in the same direction. So when we apply stress, we are not physically moving planes, kind of, 
but it works in this way like you should understand the terminology of this thing like as we apply a stress this is stress it could be small think of it it is like a small stress that the material is still in its elastic behavior there is no plasticity so as long as there is no plasticity it means that there is no dislocation movement it means that the dislocation it should be located at this side and it won't gonna move think of it in that way we still work in the elastic behavior so what's gonna happen this plane a is gonna be slightly pushed to the right the same thing is going to happen is going to push a is going to push b and b is going to push c and c is going to push d and so on so this represents like different lattice different distortion we said that the lattice distortion it will be maximum near or at the edge dislocation and is going to be decreasing as we go far from the dislocation side. Make sense? So it means that surface A, it will be pushed hard and it's gonna push B and then B is gonna push C slightly and C is gonna be, is gonna push D very slightly and D is gonna push the next plane very, very slightly and so on. So we're gonna have, as we move far, from this, from the edge dislocation, the pushing to the blades will be kind of small. Remember that we're still working in the elastic deformation. So within this elastic behavior of the material, these bones are still there. There is no bone breaking. We're still working in this elastic behavior. Think of these bones that represent like lying this like strengths. So we're just gonna keep pushing and compressing and stretching the springs, but there is no string or spring, is, it will not be broken in that case. There is no bond breaking. So how about if we increase the force? We are going to bring the material for somehow into plastic deformation. Now, let us consider the plastic deformation scenario. How is going to happen? We said the plastic deformation, this requires this plane, it should be moved. So how we can move this plane? We can basically move this plane, like think of it like this plane somehow is going to jump the plane B and is going to be squeezed in the middle between B and C. Now it is between this plane and plane B, right? So to move the dislocation, it means that all of this plane of atoms, all of these so many atoms, their count is huge count of atoms, and this atom, they're gonna leave their sides and they're gonna be squeezed in the middle. So this is one scenario, this is one option, like this dislocation or edge dislocation is going to be physically moved to be squeezed between the two other lattice sites or two other planes between B and C. But this definitely requires very, very high and huge amount of force. Why? Because you have to break all of these bonds first that form all of these so many atoms with the other plane, you have to break all of these bonds first. Then we're going to push. This requires another energy. So we need a very huge amount of energy to break the bonds between all of these atoms first. Then we are going to move. We need one more energy to move these atoms to be squeezed in the middle here and more energy to form new bonds between so you're gonna have moved this thing here and it's gonna you have to break first these bonds between b and c and you're gonna form new bonds between a b from the left side and a c from the right side so this definitely this is one scenario and this is one option how we can describe or what's how this dislocation is going to move but this require a physical movement of the dislocation itself but this thing, it is not likely to happen because as I mentioned, this requires a very huge amount of force. And in many of the cases, this is not the thing that is going to happen. But the question is still here, how the dislocation is going to move. The dislocation is not physically moved, but what is happening actually is, as you can see, this plane, there is no bonding over the other half side of the crystal, right? But the bond between plane B and C, it is ex exists with the other lower half of the crystal. So it could be easy, the other option is, it could be easy for us if we slightly push this surface A slightly to the right 
And this in the meanwhile is gonna involve the pushing of surface B slightly to the right. And in that case, these bones, they gonna be broken between B and the lower side. And the bones will start to form between the A side plane and the lower half or the lower part of the crystal. And this is the most likely thing that is going to happen and this requires lower force and lower energy and this is the thing that is likely to happen first. This is how the edge dislocation is going to move. This indicates that the edge dislocation has been moved but it is not physically moved. The plane itself, it is not migrating from one lattice side to the other lattice side but it is slightly shifted to the right or the plane slightly shifted to the right, this results in breaking the bond between the upper half of the plane to its lower half and forming the bond with the new displaced plane, which is plane A. So in that case, the plane that it will be edge dislocated, it will be plane B, not plane A. You got my point? So as you can see here, now the edge dislocation has been moved to plane B. This indicates that the plane A itself, it is not physically moved, but the location of the dislocation is the thing that is, has been moved. Did you understand it? So the plane itself, it is not moving. This is what has happened. What, this is what had happened, that this bonds between the plane B and its lower part, it has been broken. Then we reconnected this lower part of plane B with the plane A which has been slightly displaced to the right. The distance became close to form a new bond and leaving and rejecting this half without any bonding with the lower part. So this half that is now is not bonded to the lower part is gonna behave or work or it's gonna seem like it is an edge dislocation. But now the location of the edge dislocation has been shifted, has been moved to the next plane. So the thing that is moving is the dislocation line itself, not the atoms. You got it? So this is how the edge dislocation is moving inside the crystal structure. So if the applied shear stress is big enough to the interatomic bonds of plane B are ruptured, are cut with its lower half. And the upper half of the plane B becomes the extra half of plane. It will be the extra half of plane representing a new site or location of the edge dislocation while plane A will link up, will connect with the other bottom half of the plane B. If we're gonna keep on pushing the material, if we're gonna increasing the force and pushing the material, the same thing is going to happen to surface B or plane B is gonna push plane C. So plane C will be pushed to the right and these bonds between C and its lower half will be ruptured and the bond will be formed between the extra B surface or plane and the ruptured or the separated half or the lower half of surface C making surface C rejected like it is a separate plane, extra plane representing the edge dislocation. And in that case, we have to move the edge dislocation line next to surface C. Keep on increasing the force. This is gonna push it further and move the dislocation to surface D. Then as we are gonna do so, you're gonna end up with this like extra plane. It could be rejected outside the material. And that's why you're gonna see this extra part of the material indicating that there is a plastic deformation that it can be clearly seen as a distortion or the change of the shape of the material at the microscopic scale. So if the process is repeated with other plane, ultimately, at the ultimate limit, as this force is big enough and this dislocation is gonna keep on moving till it will be rejected, this extra half of plane may be projected from the other or right surface of the crystal forming an edge that is one atom distance-wise. Uh, distance so it is unit step of slip. Unit step of slip, it means that we just moving one plane or half of plane of this location, but it could be two step, it could be three step, it depends on the applied force. Macroscopically or at the microscopic scale, the material deformation will be seen as shown in that case. Make sense? So this is simply how the edge dislocation is going to move 
inside the material microstructure as I mentioned the atoms or the this extra plane of atom of the edge dislocation it is not physically moving but it breaks bonds and connects with other plane so this indicate like the dislocation the edge dislocation has been displaced or moved inside the crystal structure but as I mentioned it is not physically moving there is analogy between the edge dislocation movement and the loc uh, locomotion system of the caterpillar. Caterpillar in the perfect case, for example, it should be like kind of a straight, like this thing. As we said in chapter four, what is wrong with the edge dislocation or any kind of dislocation? One of the things why it is counted as a defect. First, there is a defect or imperfection in the crystal because it disturbs the 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 arrangement of the atoms it do changes in the lattice arrangement these planes it should be like kind of a straight now it has been distorted it is not a straight this is one thing another thing it involves the stresses like as you push a plane here the upper part will be in compression the lower part will be under tension so this gives a difference in the stress levels in between the upper half of the crystal and the lower half of the crystal as we discussed in chapter four and we are going to discuss this with more detail here in this chapter so as you can see in the dislocation as there is a dislocation there should be a lattice distortion and difference in the stresses next to the or very close to the dislocation and as we discuss in chapter 4 as we go far from the dislocation or edge dislocation this lattice distortion and this thing it will be eliminated it will be decreasing as we go far from the this from the edge dislocation or the dislocation itself so the lattice distortion or the stresses difference it will be localized, it will be around the edge dislocation and these distortion and these lattice defects will be eliminated as we go far from the edge dislocation. This is very similar in this case. Now think of it like this is the extra plane. This is the edge dislocation and this is the edge dislocation line. Now it is here. So as you can see, you're gonna find like kind of distortion in the color pillar locomotion system and it's going to be like kind of perfect on the other side far from the dislocation so here we're going to say that there is dislocation that is going to take place at this area this is the locomotion system of the caterpillar how it moves the same thing is going to happen for the uh, for, uh, for the edge dislocation so as uh, this edge dislocation is going to keep on moving like it's going to be located here in that case so you're going to find that the lattice distortion in addition to the stresses will be different within this part but other than that far from the edge dislocation it will be like kind of perfect and it's going to keep on moving in that case till it will be rejected over the other side so this is going to give like a new shape and like a perfect thing of the crystal now the crystal it is perfect as you can see, there is no any internal lattice distortion or stresses or anything. So, but we have achieved, we have achieved a plastic deformation of the material and we have converted this edge dislocation into another dislocation, which has a plastic deformation that is apparently seen in the material shape, that we have changed the material shape at the microscopic scale. And this is what, how these edge dislocation are moving, very similar to the color bearers motion over the, over the surface, make sense? So this is for the edge dislocation. How about the screw dislocation? It's gonna be the same concept. If the screw dislocation, in the screw dislocation, the direction of the dislocation motion is perpendicular to the stress direction. But something that you should understand here that we have to mention about the edge dislocation and the direction of the applied stress. In this case, we are applying the stress, for example, in this direction. So this is the direction of the applied stress that we said it should be perpendicular to the edge dislocation line or it is perpendicular to the plane of the edge dislocation but the edge dislocation line the edge dislocation line it moves in a direction so this is the direction of motion of the edge dislocation it is parallel to the direction of the applied shear stress so the applied shear stress and the edge dislocation line both they do have the same direction 
This is in the edge dislocation, but in the screw dislocation, in the screw dislocation, the direction of the dislocation motion, it will be perpendicular to the stress direction. Why? Because this is the edge dislocation line in the screw dislocation, and we are applying a stress in this direction. So this is the direction of the stress. It is parallel to the edge dislocation line, to, I'm sorry, to the screw dislocation line. Here in the screw dislocation, the direction of the stress, it is parallel to the dislocation line. And the direction of motion of the dislocation line, it will be perpendicular to the direction of the applied stress. It is the opposite to the edge dislocation. But in the edge dislocation, the direction of the stress, it is perpendicular to the dislocation line and the dislocation line moves parallel to the, it, the applied stress. But in the screw dislocation, the applied stress it is parallel to the, uh, to the line of, uh, to, uh, to the dislocation line, but the direction of motion of the dislocation line or the screw dislocation, it is perpendicular to the stress direction or the applied stress direction. Make sense? So this is uh, a different thing. We won't gonna go deeply through the details how this edge dislocation or the movement of the screw dislocation as we have done for this edge dislocation. Why? Because the screw dislocation it is kind of complicated to understand the screw thing, how it's going to happen, but I'm going to try to explain it here about especially about the stresses, okay? So this is the only thing that you need to know about the, the screw dislocation motion and uh, again, for this part, you should understand that in the edge dislocation, the plane it is not physically moving, but the thing that we are breaking the bond and we connecting to describe this motion of the of the uh, of the edge dislocation. So that's why we said that there is a knowledge with the locomotion system of the color pillar. In the, co in the color pillar, for example, this cell, this thing, this represents like a plane. Think of it in this way. When the caterpillar is moving, do you think that this, like this cell or this plane, it's a change position with any other plane? No. It just moves to allow the caterpillar motion to movement, movement. So this kind of move, they are not exchanging position. So there is no physical movement. This thing, it won't gonna be like, if we're gonna give number like one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So for example, this part, or this plane or this cell of the caterpillar body, which is number two, it will be still in the second site in the second location during the caterpillar's motion. So there is no physical movement of these unit cells or these parts of the body of the caterpillar, but instead they just moving, they are swinging and changing the stress level in some way to allow for the dislocation like it would seem that it has been moved, but physically there is no movement for the planes. They just breaking the bond and connecting and forming new bond. This is how the edge dislocation motion is going to take place. Make sense? All right, so since the plastic deformation, it is conjugate with the movement of d these dislocations. And as we mentioned, as we apply stresses or increasing the stress over the material, these dislocations are going to move. Or as we mentioned, not physically move, but their sites or their location will be changing, uh, indicating that the dislocation line is the thing that is going to move, as we mentioned. But in the meanwhile, something also that another thing that you should understand that if we increase the force over the material, more dislocation could show up. Like it is not just the same dislocation pattern that would be located inside the material microstructure, but instead up on increasing the force, more dislocation, more and more dislocation would show up in that case. So the dislocation, this introduces to, to us something that we call as dislocation density. So the dislocation density, it, it is the total length, it is the total length per unit volume of the dislocation. Like for example, think of it like you do have a unit volume of a material, and for some reason we decided to count the length of these dislocations because we said that the dislocation it is, uh, or the plastic deformation it is conjugate to the movement of the dislocation line, so we can simply measure the length of these dislocations 
And if we divided the total length of all the dislocation that could be exist inside the material microstructure bear the unit volume of this material, we're gonna end up with the dislocation density. But in order to do so, these dislocations are at the atomic level. And this required that we should use a microscope with a very high resolution and magnification factor so we can see exactly inside the material microstructure. And we should see in three-dimensional state because we are talking about a volume. Volume, it should be three-dimensional thing. So it could be difficult for us to count or to calculate the dislocation length and divide it, divide this dislocation length by the unit volume of the material to end up with the dislocation density. So this approach, this is the general definition of the dislocation, but to do it experimentally, it is not that easy. The other option is, and this is what we basically do, that we count the number of the dislocations or the number of the dislocation lines that intersect a unit area of a random section. Because in the TM, the transmission electro microscope, when we prepare a sample of the material, we're gonna look at it through the microscope, we're gonna see a surface area. As we're gonna end up with an image like this one, this image, it is, it, it is anyway represent a surface area or within the material microstructure. So it is an area, it is not a volume. In that case, in order to approximately determine the dislocation density, and instead of calculating the length of the dislocation and divide by the volume, we can simply count the number of the dislocations within a specific area of this material sample per unit area. And if you divide it by this area, you're gonna end up with the dislocation density. And this is how we basically determine these dislocations. As we discussed in chapter four, the dislocation it will appear in the TM, the transmission electro microscope, in these images like dark sites. The difference in the contrast in the grains or inside the one single grain inside the within this image indicate that there is a dislocation that exists. For example, this figure on the left, this is the thing that we discussed in chapter four. We said that this is like a single crystal and all of these dark lines represent multiple and different types and forms of dislocation. It is not necessary to be just only edge dislocation. It could be screw dislocation or mixture. We said that it is most likely to be mixture between edge and screw dislocation. So all of these lines, all of these cracks, which would seem like a crack, these are in fact, these are the dislocation and they are so many. So simply to calculate the dislocation density for this material, if you're gonna calculate the area of this image, this area we can calculate it by the length of this edge times the length of this edge, you're gonna end up simply with the area of this surface, of this material sample, how much it is. And remember, this is already done at the nanoscale. It means that you're gonna multiply like nanoscale length times another nanoscale length, you're gonna end up with the area. But how we can count the number of the dislocation? Then your objective is just to count. This is one dislocation, another dislocation, a third, fourth, and so on. Gonna keep on counting these dislocation. If you divided the number of the dislocation over this area of this image, you're gonna end up with the approximate number, how much the dislocation density within this material, how much it is. But in order to count the number of dislocation, it is not that easy, right? As you can see, we do have so many dislocations. So does it make sense, for example, that I still gonna keep on counting these dislocations inside the material? Now we do have some software that used over image processing and this software simply they can, they can count these, how many edge dislocation based on the difference in the contrast uh, within this image. So they're gonna do analysis, this software is gonna do analysis to these images and then it's gonna count approximately how these dislocations, the number of the dislocation, then if you divided this number of dislocation by this unit area, you're gonna end up directly by the dislocation densities. Now the TM, the microscope itself, it is sensor is already connected to a computer. The computer can, can give you this data directly because the computer is gonna do analysis to this image the same way and it's gonna count the number of the dislocation divided by the surface area of this image because all of this information is already 
we receive from the TM through the computer, so they already over the computer, so there are some software that already embedded with the, or comes with the TM, that is gonna directly give you the dislocation density. So for example, when we do tests, we can determine or we can know exactly how much of the dislocation density within this material, how much it is. Make sense? This dislocation density indicates how severely this material has been plastically deformed. This is one of the things. So as we're increasing the force we are that applied over the material, we are expecting that the dislocation density is going to increase. So this table, for example, shows some examples of the dislocation densities of some materials. But before I go, let us see this other image of the TM. This image on the left represents one single grain, and you can clearly see the dislocation inside this single grain. But here, for example, in this image, we do have multiple grains. It is not just one grain. As you can see, this little thing, this is like one grain, and there is another grain, there is another grain. So all of these are different grains. But also, as you can see, there is a contrast. There is a difference in the contrast between these different in the color contrast in the color of between these different grains. Like this grain is kind of white, but this grain is very dark. So this grain, which is very dark, it indicates that it has so many dislocations. It is filled with many, many dislocations, but this one, it is the number of the dislocation within this, this grain, it is not that big. It is very a small amount of dislocation, so that's why it would seem with white appearance. The same thing, this has a few dislocations, but the dislocation is are increasing in this part, over this part, over this part, and so on. So as you can see, this also indicates that the dislocation pattern, it could be different, or the number of the dislocation, or the dislocation density, it could be different from one grain to another grain. But for example, in this case, we are representing, we are going to count using the image analysis techniques, we are going to count and estimate the number of the dislocation that represent this polycrystalline material. We said that polycrystalline material is the one that is composed of multiple grains. So it means that the dislocation density, it is not necessary to be the same within all the grains that form a polycrystalline material, but it is a representative. This number of the dislocation density, it is a representative how the dislocation density will be inside the material microstructure. As I mentioned, it is not necessary to have the same dislocation density within all the grains. Make sense? So for example, a carefully solidified metal, metal crystal, like you have a metal crystal that is made like, for example, steel. It is a metal alloy that is made by melting the steel into a furnace, the iron into a furnace, adding some carbon, and then we're just gonna leave it till the solidification to be in a solid state. So it is now liquid, it will be converted to be solid. So in that case, mostly the dislocation density within this steel that is already made by steel making technologies, it will be like 10 to the bar three millimeter to the bar negative two. So it will be like 1000 per unit uh, millimeter area. For plastically deformed metal, if you don't have a piece of metal, like piece of steel or aluminum or copper or whatever, and you are going to plastically deform this material, uh, it means that you have to apply stress over this material to bring it to the plastic deformation. So the number of the dislocation density is going to be increased. It will be way bigger. It will be like 10 to the power nine up to 10 to the power 10 millimeter square uh, uh, to the power negative two or per millimeter square, this is gonna give us the plastic in case that you have a plastically deformed material. So that's why we are expecting, as we plastically deform the material and as we increasing the force, the number of the dislocation density or the dislocation density is going to be increasing, indicating that there are more and more dislocation that is going to generate. So this indicates that as we bring the material by nature, there should be a dislocation there. We said that it is difficult to find this perfect crystal structure. It is difficult to find this material that is completely free of these locations. Anyway, even when we prepare this material, when we manufacture this material, anyway, there should be some dislocations. But the count of this dislocation could be very small. 
It is kind of negligible, like 10 to the power 3, it is very negligible amount of dislocation. But as we plastically deform the material in order to do anything to it, these amounts of this dislocation density will be increased significantly as already given here. For example, heat treatment of plastically deformed metal, and this is another thing that you should understand. That like if you do have a metal that you have plastically deformed it, after the plastic deformation, the dislocation density will reach up to 10 to the power 9 over millimeter square. But how about if after you have done the plastic deformation, you decided to do heat treatment? Heat treatment, it is a manufacturing method or a method that would involve heating the metal into a certain temperature, most likely lower than the lower, a certain temperature, and definitely it will not be melted. The metal will not be melted. It will be in the solid state, but it will be heated. Then we are going to cool it down to the room temperature at a certain rate. This is known as heat treatment. And the heat treatment, there is not one process. There are a bunch of processes that we are going to discuss uh, after a while. We are going to discuss these heat treatment, heat treatment things. But if we have done a heat treatment over the material that is, was plastically deformed, the heat treatment relieves the dislocation decreases the number of the dislocation. So again, the plastic deformation increases the number of the dislocation densities significantly, but the heat treatment decreases the number of the dislocation density slightly. It could be like decreased significantly or slightly depending on the type of the heat treatment and process. So as you can see, before the heat treatment, the number of dislocation was 10 to the power 9. Now it has been decreased to 10 to the power 5 up to 10 to the power 6 per millimeter square. Because of what? Because of the heat treatment. In ceramic material, so all of these are metals. In ceramic material, the number of the dislocation density, it should be lower than the one that would exist in metals. Why? Because as we discussed over this slide, metal, the dislocation formation in metal, it would be easy than in ceramic material because of the type of bonding. So that's why we are expecting in ceramic material that the dislocation density should be much more lower or smaller than the dislocation density in metal. So that's why it is 10 to the power 2 up to 10 to the power 4 per millimeter square. And for example, in single crystal, the number of the dislocation density is very, very small. Silicon it is a ceramic material. And since it is one crystal, it is just one single crystal, so it is most likely to be like kind of perfect, very close to be perfect. Here we are not dealing with multiple grains or multiple crystals inside the material. Instead, we have only one crystal, so definitely the number of the dislocation density will be like 0.1 up to 1 per millimeter square of the material, indicating that a single crystal of the ceramic material uh, or silicon, it is kind of like a perfect because 0 0.1 is very, very small amount of dislocation that would be exist inside this material. Make sense? So this is, what does it mean a dislocation density? Again, it is a measure. We can use the dislocation density to know how this microstructure is going to be affected by the changes in the forces, like plastic deformation or the heat treatment by any other thing inside the material structure or we are exposing the material, we can measure these changes over the, by measuring the dislocation density. So it is a very good and important measure. Another thing that you should know about the dislocation movement, and this, this is the, very similar to the thing that we discussed very quickly in chapter four, is that the lattice strain due to dislocation. As we said that, this occasion, it will achieve some lattice distortion that is going to change the arrangement of atoms or the do changes over the lattice or a crystallographic plane of atom, but in the meanwhile, it's going to produce some strains or some stresses inside the material. These occasions would produce lattice strains, which are considered as residual strain. What does it mean a residual strain? A residual strain, it is something that is extra that we basically didn't plan for. And this is another thing that very important, especially for mechanical engineer, when we do design for any material or use material to design any mechanical system or mechanical component, we have to consider 
this residual stresses that would be embedded inside the material microstructure when we do these calculations for the design purposes. Make sense? But as I mentioned, this it will become like a residual strain, a residual stress that we didn't plan for. So it is kind of a defect over the natural thing or over the ideal state of the crystal that you're gonna have this extra strain that comes because of the dislocation. This lattice strain or lattice stress or extra stress that comes because of the dislocation, it could be compressive, it could be tensile, it could be pure shear as twisting. So we do have three forms of these strains. The strain, it could be compressive strain, it could be tensile strain, it could be twisting or pure shear inside the material microstructure. So these are different types of the strains. Like for example, in the case of the edge dislocation, as you can see, this is like an extra plane that has been squeezed between the crystallographic planes. And this is the edge dislocation line that terminates inside the crystal. Because of this edge dislocation, it terminates inside the crystal. The stress above the dislocation line, it becomes compression. And the, the stress or the strain above the dislocation line becomes compression because this is the last line plane that already bonding. So there is bond here, there is bond here, but there is no bonding with the other side. With the lower part, it will be under tension. As we discussed in chapter four, we said that this bond will be stretched, but this bond will be compressed. So that's why over the upper, the upper part, the compression, there is a compression, but the other half, the other half of the plane, it is under tension. So there is a difference, there is a defect, there is imperfection in the stress according to the stress level, according to the strain level. The strain it should be the same type, the same value everywhere in the ideal case. But thanks to this or because of this dislocation, we're going to end up with a compression on the upper part and tension in the lower part. The same thing is going to happen in the, in case that we do have a screw dislocation. So to understand it well, this type of straining and the lattice distortion, let us consider this perfect crystal. A perfect crystal, it, you're gonna have all the atoms are arranged perfectly over very, very straight planes. So these are vertical plane, horizontal plane, everything is vert perfect. There is no screw dislocation, there is no edge dislocation. And let us think of this bond like it is a very soft fiber, virtual fiber, something that is already like a string or a fiber between this bond is represented like it is a fiber between these different atoms. So what's going to happen in case that we do have an edge dislocation? As you squeeze an edge here in the middle between two other planes, in addition, it's going to achieve some lattice distortion, it's going to achieve a, 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 an imperfection or a defect over the strain and the stress levels. Why? Because as you can see, if we're gonna choose this bond, which is represented like a fiber, to squeeze this extra plane or this extra half of plane, this fiber should be shorter, should be shortened. It should be decreased in the length, indicating that it has been compressed. The same thing here, the distance become, becomes shorter, shorter, shorter. So all of these fibers are compressed. So this will result in a compression over the upper part. While the fiber here will be stretched, will be longer, will be elongated farther because of squeezing this plate. This one will be elongated, but it is not that much like the upper one. It, this one will be elongated, but it is not uh, that much like the other upper ones. Right, so it means, but anyway, these all of these fibers over the lower part will be stretched, will be subject to attention. So that's why we do have attention over the lower part and a compression over the upper part. This is in the edge dislocation. The same thing in the screw dislocation. In the screw dislocation, if you do have a plane of atom in that case, and think of it like the bond between these two atoms, it represented like a fiber, a very thin, small fiber here. And as we screw, screw it means that you're going to rotate one half with respect to the other half. One to the, with respect to the other one, this is going to produce a twisting into this fiber. This fiber will be twisted in that case, right? Because of the applied shear stresses that would be needed to produce some 
uh, twist dislocation or, uh, into the material or screw dislocation into the material. So this twisting will produce a twisting as a shear stress. The guys of the mechanical engineer, they know what does it mean twisting it is. It is a kind of pure shear that comes due to or produces a torsional stress over, or torsional strain over the material. So it is a pure shear thing that is going to act over this fiber, virtual fiber, indicating that there is a screw dislocation or twist dislocation. So generally speaking, as we mentioned, there is a lattice distortion that is going to be produced within the material because of what? Because of the dislocation. This lattice strain or lattice distortion, it is important and it do have an effect over the mechanical properties of the material. And this is what we are going to discuss over the second part of this chapter. Make sense? Last thing that we are going to mention here is the lattice, uh, the dislocation interaction. So dislocation interactions, what does it mean? For example, as we mentioned, as I showed over this figure, as you can see, there are lots of dislocation lines. There are lots of different types of dislocation, like this is a, an edge dislocation, there is another dislocation here, a dislocation line, and so they are kind of interacting to each other. So how about if we apply it one more force? More, we increase the force that acting over this material. What's going to happen to this dislocation? Are these dislocation are going to increase or they gonna cancel each other. So this requires that we should understand the interaction between these different dislocations. So let us focus over a two edge dislocation. Two edge dislocations of the same sign. Or what's going to happen in case that we have two edge dislocations of two opposite signs. So what does it mean a sign? As you can see in the edge dislocation, this is the edge dislocation line. This part, it will be under compression. This one, it will be under tension, right? As we said, if as you add, this is the line dislocation, right? The dislocation line. So this vertical standing thing in directs or indicates the compression side and blue, this horizontal line indicates the tension side. So it means that this is a dislocation that is located at this site that has the sign that here it is compression and there it is tension. T stands for tension, C stands for compression. The same thing, the other dislocation next to it, so these are like two different dislocations, but they are next to each other, very close together, and you're gonna have here uh, the dislocation, it is of the same sign. Here over the upper part will be compression, over the lower part will be tension. So if we apply more force over the material, what do you expect? Of, this, of these two uh, dislocations of the same sign. So these are two dislocations of the same sign. But these two dislocations are two opposite signs. So what do you expect in case that they do have the same sign? They're gonna be repulsive. There is a repulsive force that is going to generate between them because of the similarity in the sign, because the compression side, there is compression side over this one, and the tension is tension over the same side. So when you apply more force, this dislocation is going to move to the right, while this dislocation is going to move to the left. We said that the plastic deformation involves movement of the dislocations, right? So inside the material, you aren't gonna have only one dislocation, you're gonna have millions of dislocations. So if they are of the same sign, they're gonna move apart. Because of what? Because of the similarity in the compression level, the strain level. So that's why this lattice strain, it is important to understand it. In case that they are of the same sign, they're gonna be repulsive to each other. So having the same slip plane, and the other condition that they should have the same slip plane, they are sharing the same slip plane because this is the, this edge dislocation is going to move to the left. This one is going to move to the left, uh, right. So the slip plane will be coming between them. So they will be repulsive as long as they do have the same sign and the repulsive forces produced that tends to move them apart, as already shown here. But in case that they are of the same sign, two opposite sides. I'm sorry, the other scenario. This is here is a compression. Here it is tension, there it is tension, over the upper part here it is compression. So they are of two opposite signs 
In that case, having sharing the same slip plane, they still have the same slip plane. So in that case, they're going to move towards each other in case that we're applying an external force, more plastic deformation over these two dislocations. So there is a dislocation here at this position, and there is another dislocation of two opposite signs. When we apply a force, they're going to come close to each other, and they're going to cancel this each other. So in case that we have two dislocations of two opposite signs and having and sharing the same slave plane will attract to one another. They're gonna attract each other with one another and the dislocation and annihilation is gonna take or cancellation is gonna take place or will occur. So these, this is known as dislocation annihilation. Annihilation, it means that these dislocation will be canceled. It means that the number of the dislocation density could be decreasing in that case, in case that we are adding more dislocations or plastic deformation over the material. Despite this is not exactly the case that is going to take place in case that we are increasing the plastic deformation, because as we discussed over this table, if we plastically deform the material, definitely the number of the dislocation density is going to increase. But in and but this is basically what is going to take place in case that we do have a heat treatment. In the heat treatment, we are going to cancel the dislocation. Then dislocation they gonna be cancelled because of the heat treatment, and in, especially in case that we do have these dislocations somehow of the same of two opposite signs, so they are gonna cancel each other, and we are gonna end up with a dislocation annihilation, which is one of the mechanism that is could take place inside the material microstructure. Make sense? So that's it for this part. The objective again is, or this video, and is to discuss what does it mean this occasion, which already we have discussed this over chapter four, but the objective is to understand the plastic deformation, how it's gonna take place inside the material microstructure and how it would be related to the dislocation movement and to understand what does it mean dislocation density and the effect of the lattice strain over the dislocation. Make sense? So that's it for this video and thank you so much and see you in another one.